All right, Genesis this morning, chapter 13. Genesis chapter 13. We left Abram in a difficult spot. He's got an upset wife and an unhappy Pharaoh. Not good. Father, we settle our hearts before you. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We pray, Father, uh, for the flower show team that goes down today. Encourage them, strengthen them, protect them, Lord. Thank you. Last week, just uh, what a report. 4,000 cards handed out to people, tracks. Pray for even some sitting in this service, Lord. You would like to use them. It's amazing. The open door that's there, just to tell people about the love of God. And to send them home with a card explaining how much you love them. Thank you, Lord. Please just make it a fruitful day for your kingdom. Thank you, Lord, for the chance to share the gospel yesterday at the Grand Prix for Awana. Lord, we pray for those who don't know you. Seed would find good soil. And we bless your name, Lord, that you're committed to us, no matter what we've done. Pray you'd make your word alive now for us in the second service. In Jesus' name, amen. And so chapter 12, a little reminder here, verse 18. Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this that you have done to me? Pause. Pause. And Abram's just sitting there. Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? I wonder if he still has like the botch or the boils or all whatever the plague was all over. He's like, you know, why didn't you, you know, as he's scratching away there, why didn't you tell me she's your wife? Why did you say she is my sister? You know, and all the guys, the little fans in their robes are looking at him like, I might have taken her to me to be a wife. Now, therefore, behold your wife, take her, and go your way. And Pharaoh commanded his men concerning Abram, and they sent him, they escorted the guy out of Egypt. <laughs> and his wife and all that he had. So chapter 13, and Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had, and Lot was with him. And again, you know, I, how did that trip back go? You know, well, that's a really nice dress, honey. Did Pharaoh, choo -choo -choo -choo. it was a told you. She has to be so, uh, women in the room, would you not be ticked with your husband for throwing you under the bus like that? I mean, no? Only two women, really? <laughs> Boy, first service was a whole different outcome there. Here's another thing that's interesting. He went out with his wife, all that he had, which now includes Hagar, and Lot with him. I wonder if Lot started losing respect for Abram. You take us down to Egypt, you lie. We go through this whole nonsense with this Pharaoh. We barely get out of there without, you know, getting killed. And, you know, I wonder if this for Lot really just kind of, hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, so Lot was with them, and they went into the south. And Abram was very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. And he went on his journeys from thence from the south, even to Bethel, unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Hai, or Hai. Interesting, Bethel is Bethel, house of God, high heap of ruins and so often isn't that where we are we're you know we're either going towards the house of God or if we turn away from him we're going toward that heap of ruins of what we'll make with our lives but he's back to this place where he started at the beginning and isn't that interesting he made some mistakes in Egypt I, I think it's pretty clear he comes back having been escorted out his wife's upset with him lot I think is going mm. you know it's not been a good time what does he do he goes back to where he was at the beginning we mess up in our walk with God. We blow it. What do we need to do? We need to come back to just sitting at his feet in the beginning. Interestingly enough, to turn to Revelation chapter 2. We see this in the last book of the Bible, writing to the churches. Revelation chapter 2. It's a major right-hand turn. If you have a tab, it's the last one you got, aside from maps. Chapter 2 says this, Unto the angel, the messenger, probably the pastor of the church of Ephesus, write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars. Chapter 1, those are the seven angels or messengers, many feel seven pastors of these churches, in his right hand, 
who walketh among the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Those are the seven churches we're told from chapter one. The church is supposed to bring light to the world. I know your works and your labor and your patience, perseverance, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. They've defended the faith. And has borne and has patience for my name's sake, has labored and has not fainted. Nevertheless, I have against thee, because thou hast left, not lost, they left. You've left your first love. Interesting. Remember, therefore, from whence you are fallen and return, or sorry, and repent and do the first works. Remember, repent and return. Or else I will come unto you quickly, and I will remove your lampstand or candlestick out of his place, except you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, Nike, victory, laity, people, hierarchy. You hate the deeds of the hierarchy, which I also hate. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcomes, I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Interesting. Abram had a bad time. He made bad decisions, and he, and he lied. And he got called on it by the ungodly. And now he's coming back, having reaped this, you know, it's, you know, not good. And he comes back to the beginning. When we stumble, when we fall, when we fail. And it does happen, doesn't it? How often we need to just come back to that simple beginning of sitting at the Lord's feet and again listening to him instead of our own ideas. So he came back to the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Hai. And to the place of the altar, which he had made there at first, you know, and as he's approaching it, I wonder just in his heart what's going on. And Abram called on the name of the Lord. God told him, I will bless those who bless thee, and I will what? Curse those who curse thee. Did God judge Pharaoh? Did he? Sure, he, right? He plagued his household, and he plagued Pharaoh. And, and so even though... Abram was not faithful. Who still was? God. You mean even when I'm not a faithful witness, yet he is still faithful to me? Answer? Yeah. Yes. How many have heard the word grace before? Our salvation is dependent upon the work of Christ on the cross. He died and rose again. We receive it. It's a gift. Well, then I'm just going to go live the way I want. You don't understand the gift then. But it's grace. Grace. And I think Abram coming back, you know, you know, after you do something, the postmortem kind of on it, like, what, why did I say that? What did I, why didn't I handle them differently? Why didn't, does anybody have that problem here? No, first service did. You guys, no? This section does. You sit on these sections, don't you? Know, you? You sit there going, oh, man, if I could do it over, I would do it so differently. Abram's going through that very thing. He comes back to the altar. He begins to call upon the name of the Lord. And as he's thinking about all that's happened, wait a minute. God plagued Pharaoh's household. And God got me out of there safely. Even though he wasn't faithful, God still was. What a blessing. The Lord is still faithful to us. And so he came back to that place of the altar. And he called on the name of the Lord. And Lot also, which went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents. And the land was not able to bear them that they might dwell together. For their substance was great, so that they could not dwell together. All I know is that Abram didn't have this problem before he went to Egypt, which means Sarah must be like some serious prize because he came back with all kinds of stuff from that whole deal. Now the land can't support them. And there was strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. Interesting little side note from the Holy Spirit. And the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled then in the land. Okay, first things first. How many understand that Eastern, that Oriental culture of respect for your elders? How many understand this? If you don't know this, there's an extreme respect for those who are older than you are. Okay? Lot is Abram's nephew. Therefore, Lot should have respect for Abram. How many are still with me? Did I lose anybody yet? Okay, now let's look at what happened. There was strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. You know what should have happened? Lot should have pulled his guys in and said, you leave my uncle's herdmen alone. You guys go find some other pastures. Don't you dare disrespect my uncle like this. That's what should have happened, did it? 
No, which leads me back to, I think, Lada's lost respect for him. Interesting. Rather than make this thing right, it's become a point of contention. Notice also verse 7 what we're told. The Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelt then in the land. Well, that helps to understand why the resources are a little more scarce. It's not just Abram and Lot, there's some others. But it also sends a message. There's strife between Abram's herdsmen and Lot's herdsmen, and they're supposed to be following the true and living God. Meanwhile, the pagan Canaanite and Perizzites, they're living just fine. What a shame, huh? Kind of sad when, again, God's people do things that shouldn't be happening, and the unbelievers see it. The Canaanite and the Perizzite, they dwelled then in the land. So Abram said unto Lot, who should have started this conversation? Lot. Abram said unto Lot, let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, between thy herdmen and my herdmen, for we are brethren. Interesting, notice please for the record, the one who is more mature spiritually is the one who comes and tries to get the problem reconciled. Isn't that interesting? Abram's the one who takes, it should, it should all respect and culturally, it should be Lot stepping up to the plate saying, you know, unk, unk, I'm sorry, man, this was wrong. Uh, I'll get it handled. No, it takes Abraham to reconcile the problem. Sometimes there's problems between God's people, aren't there? Not this service, I know. First service, third service, I know. But you guys are fine. And we wait for the other person. I'm not going to go to them. They're going to have to come to me. Abram has every right to wait, and yet he goes to get it figured out. Hey, we're brethren. Ooh, that's interesting. What are we? We're what and what in Christ? Brothers and sisters. Jesus said, Matthew 18, if your brother offends you, not text them, call them, email them. They had messaging. It wasn't instant, but they had it. No, he said, go to them. Look at their face. When you call them on what's going on, tell them his offense. If he hears you, you've gained your brother. Good, problem solved. Most problems we see are handled right there if you just go to them. And you approach them the way you want to be approached. If they don't hear you, then you bring a second person. Why? Because that second person is telling the offending person, your behavior is so bad, I have to be here to tell you your behavior is that bad. And usually that's the end of it. We rarely see it go beyond that. But there sometimes are problems between the people of God, and they do need to be addressed. And Abram is the one who steps up to the plate to deal with it. He's the one who's more mature. He said to Lot, let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, between thy herdmen and my herdmen, for we're brethren. Is not the whole land before you? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right hand. If thou wilt take the right hand, then I will go to the left hand. Who should have had first choice? Lot should have said, Uncle Abraham, no, no, no. You, you choose first. No, he doesn't do that. Snapshot. Something's going on in Lot's heart. And Lot lifted up his eyes. Oh, this seems to be by sight. And beheld all the plain of the Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere. Okay, why can't they abide together? What's the problem? Too many what? Too many cattle. What do cattle eat? Grass. What does grass need? Water. How many got the picture? Say. He saw that it was well watered. Notice what the Holy Spirit throws in here for us. Just a little teaching. Verse 10. Before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. That's a little like caveat there, isn't it? Oh, look, it's beautiful before God destroyed it. Why did he destroy it? Because it was wicked. Hmm, should I be there? I, I got an email this week from somebody saying, uh, there's this movement afoot in the church about, you know, uh, helping the planet, you know, going green and all that stuff. And, and they're talking about, he, he said, what do you think? You know, he said, what do you think? And I said, well, and he had some other people give him opinion. That, uh, Peter tells me the earth's going to melt with a fervent heat. Revelation tells me that the old earth's not found anymore. There's a new heaven, new earth, no more sea. So uh, in my mind, why are you bothering? I mean, I don't think you should just start dumping plutonium down the storm drains either and, you know, and poisoning the people. But, but on the other side, they're, they're holding conferences now to talk about how to save the planet. How about the church holds conferences on how to save the people? on the planet. How's that for an idea? Just, you know, 
Same idea here. It was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. We get so busy trying to obtain just our little hunk of this ground here or, my, or this corner office or this or that thing, and it's all going to go away. You know, you look at Lot like, <laughs> oh, what a fool. And yet we do it all the time. Oh, I've got to have this, and it's going to melt with a fervent heat. Anyway. He lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Even as the garden of the Lord, that's interesting. Someone was able to give us that comparison. Like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zoar. And Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan. You know something? You can tell a lot from people by what they choose. Seriously. If you just take a step back, people at work, people, you know, family, whatever, just take a step back and look at some of the choices they make. You can actually tell a lot about people, where their priorities are. Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. And Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent toward Sodom. In case you don't understand that, next verse. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Now, I don't know about you, but Lot has always been a bit of a conundrum to me. I look at how this guy behaves, and I scratch my head going. And without Peter telling me that Lot was a righteous man who was vexed by the evil he was beholding there in Sodom and Gomorrah, without that, I would have to struggle to answer if I think I'd see him in heaven, personally. Because I, I see the guy just constantly after things of the flesh, you know, and then when he, get, he chooses Sodom and Gomorrah, he sets his tent up in the direction of Sodom and Gomorrah, and by the time we get into the next chapter, he's taken captive because he's living in Sodom and Gomorrah. And that's the way it usually goes. We put ourselves in a direction towards ungodliness, towards something wicked. We think we're okay out on the periphery. You know, you, you start playing around with YouTube. You don't watch out what you're doing. Next thing you know, you're into porn. Next thing you know, you're meeting people online. Next thing you know, you're caught up in an affair. Because you started going in a direction you shouldn't be going. And we could fill in the blank with the different sins and problems. You start heading in a direction you know isn't right, but you're a mature Christian, you have liberty. And pretty soon, the thing grabs you. Lots of very interesting study. If you ever have the time, take a look at it. Real bad decisions. I mean, angels have to come to his house to drag him out of town. If that doesn't, you know, we're, you know, we're destroying the city, you have to leave. And what does he do? Well, I don't know. I think we should go. They have to grab him by his hand, a daughter by the hand, his wife by hand, the other daughter by the hand, and drag them out because they tell him, we can't destroy this city until you're out of here. Why? Because Abraham interceded with the Lord in chapter 18 and said, will you destroy the righteous with the wicked? I still have a hard time, like, putting Lot in that category. Wait a minute. When he judges this earth for a seven-year period for the rejection of God, if he dragged Lot out, where does that leave us who believe him by faith? Out of here. Interesting. You know, it didn't go well there either, and his poor wife got assaulted, and things went bad, and just, you know, <laughs> we'll get there later. i got to have something. Come on. Huh? We'll get there later. This come back for those chapters but well so lot dwelled in the plain cities of the plain he pitched his tent toward sodom but the men of sodom were wicked and sinners before the lord exceedingly see the land was so fertile they had too much time on their hands interesting verse 14 and the lord said could also be now now the lord said you see there are times when God is trying to get rid of something in your life. Abram, leave the land of your fathers, separate yourself from among your father's household, your kindred, and go to the land I will show you. What does he do? He takes Terah with him. Terah dies in Haran. Then he takes Lot with him. Has he left his father's household and his kindred? No. There are things in your life God wants to get rid of. And yet, you're holding on to it. 
So what he does is God goes, okay, fine. And he begins to let it become uncomfortable. It begins to be a problem. To where finally it gets so bad, you're like, oh, fine. You let go of it. And God goes, God, now I can work. And that's what was going on here. He's been trying to get Lot out. Finally, Lot leaves. Verse 14, now, after Lot's gone. Notice this. The Lord said unto Abram, after Lot was separated from him. Now God can get moving again because this thing that's been an impediment is out of his life. Took a while. God was patient. Maybe there's some impediments in your right now, your life, that shouldn't be there. And God's been trying to deal with you. He's been trying to call you in your heart. You're not listening. He's turned up the heat. And he wants this out of the way because he wants to use you. And Satan's lying to you, saying, no, hold on to it. It's much better. No, it's a lie. Nothing better than having God use you and having his plan. Now, after that, Lot was separated from him. God said to Abram, lift up now your eyes. Look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, including the area Lot's in, and westward. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. Does he have any seed yet? No, he doesn't. But God has been faithful to curse those who cursed him. So he's learning. God is faithful. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth. And he's done that. So that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land of the length of it and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto you. And then Abram removed his tent and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and built there an altar unto the Lord. Interesting, King David, well, David had been fleeing from before King Saul. King Saul tries to kill himself. The Amalekite finishes the job as they're being defeated before the Philistines. One comes out of the battle, reports to David that Saul is dead. David inquires of the Lord and says, well, where do I go now to go back to Israel from Ziklag? And the Lord says, go to Hebron. Very important town, has a couple of major events occur there including David returning in 2 Samuel 2. And so they go to Hebron. He's at Mamre. Chapter 14. And it came to pass in the days of Aram Ephel, king of Shin Shinar, and Arioch, king of Elisar, and Shadalamer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of Waves. Sorry, I couldn't resist. I just, uh, Tidal, Tidal, you got it. You, you got to do it. I'm, I did it the last time we taught the book, and I'm, I'm sorry. I just, these made war with Bera, king of Sodom, and with Bersha, king of Gomorrah, and with Shinab, king of Adma, and with Shimember, king of Zeboim, and with Bela, the king of Bela, which is Zoar. In other words, we got trouble. Back to verse 1. Came to pass in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar. Some historians, especially if you read from the 1800s, they tell you that this is Hammurabi, of Hammurabi's law code. Later historians say, no, we don't think it's Hammurabi. Why am I telling you this? Because if you're reading this and studying it for yourself, you may bump into one of the other opinions and you can go work it out for yourselves. Hammurabi was around 2100 to 1958 BC. That could, in theory, overlap with Abram. But you know what? We'll wait till heaven to find it all out. They did find Hammurabi's law code. How many have heard of that? History class when you were sleeping. Remember? They did find that in 1902 in Susa, that, that area where you would find Nehemiah leaving to come back to rebuild the city, and Daniel in chapter 8 is receiving that amazing vision that we had covered on Tuesday morning. So anyway, lots of things interlock. But anyway, Amraphel, king of Shinar. What is important is what is the area of Shinar? What town? What do you think of when you think of Shinar? Oh, first service, man. They like Babylon. Yeah, the Chaldeans. So here we have again the influence of Nimrod, now beginning to conquer. Ariok, king of Elisar, maybe Ariuk from history, maybe the same person. Shadalamer, king of Elam, lower Mesopotamia. Tidal or Tuhulaya, Hittite king, king of nations. These made war with Bera, the king of Sodom, with Bersha, the king of Gomorrah, Shinab, the king of Adma, Shimember, the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, which is Zoar. All these were joined together in the Vale of Siddim, which is the Salt Sea, down at the Dead Sea. Twelve years, these five kings around Sodom and Gomorrah served Shadalamer. In the thirteenth year, they rebelled. Interesting, first use of the number 13, and it is tied to rebellion. Interesting. Thirteenth year, they rebelled. In the fourteenth year came Shadalamer with the kings that were with him, and they smote the Rephames and the Ast in Astaroth, Karnaim, and the Zumzims, and Ham, and the Emons, and Shaveth, Kiriathame, and the Horites, and their Mount Seir, 
This is the bench of the area, the Edomites, the cliffs, Petra. Unto El Paran, which is by the wilderness. And they returned and they came to Unmishpat, which is Kadesh, and they smote all the country of the Amalekites and also the Amorites that dwelled in Hazazan Tamar. And when, they went out, the king of, and when they went out, the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Adma, the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, the same as Zoar, and they joined battle with them in the valley of Siddim, with Shadalamr, the king. Does anybody notice we have a lot of kings here? Anybody? All right, just making sure you didn't miss that. With Shadalamr, the king of Elam, interestingly enough, monumental records have verified some of these people from history. Not only do they show the line of the native kings of Shinar and that it was interrupted by those from Elam, which would be Shadalamr, Shadalamr, but they also talk about just how Shadalamr's signet, his official signet, was found, the seal, and it was taken to the British Museum in the 1880s and deciphered. The guy's historic. So in other words, there's a lot of kings fighting against Abram, and we figured out they're historic. Everybody still got that? Good, okay, I didn't lose anybody. Shadalamr, king of Elam, title king of nations, Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Arioch, king of Elisar, four kings with five. That would have been much easier. And the Vale of Siddim was full of slime pits. What do you know? There's slime pits around Sodom and Gomorrah. <laughs> this is documented by history. The, the Dead Sea will often have hunks of bitumen that would come up and float in it. It would actually just kind of burp them up. Gee, I wonder where they should drill for oil in Israel. So much so the Romans would call the Dead Sea the Asphaltis. Because there was so much of this stuff floating up all the time. That's what the Romans call it. That's the asphalt thing over there with the stuff floating in it. This is verified from history. There were slime pits. And when the Dead Sea would overtake this with his judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah, these things still send up stuff on the surface. Kings of Sodom and Gomorrah, they fled. And they fell there. They that remained fled to the mountain. And they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah with all their victuals, which we would know as victuals. And they went their way. And you know, this would have been a non-event except for the next verse. And they took Lot. Wait a second. I thought he was living outside of town. Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom. You see, there's a problem when we get associated with the things of the world. We might just get caught up with them. Not a good thing. They took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom, his goods, and departed. And there came one from that had escaped, sorry, and told Abram the Hebrew. First use of Hebrew. Remember chapter 10, the table of nations? You guys kind of made it through that. Remember Eber? was in the line of Abram, and they became the Eberus, okay, from the line of Eber. That's the idea, Hebrew, Abram the Hebrew. For he dwelt in the plain of Mamre, the Amorite. So Mamre's an Amorite. He's a neighbor. The brother of Eshkel, he's a neighbor. The brother of Aner, he's another neighbor. These were confederate with Abram. So he moves into town, makes friends with his neighbors, and they all help each other. When Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants born in his own house they were considered to be more loyal than servants you would acquire with money because they've been with you you know them he earned his own trained servants born in his own house 318 wow he's got a lot of servants and those are just the ones born in his house now i don't think these are all the servants because what we've known of sarah you can't leave her alone for a minute without somebody trying to marry her so i think he probably left somebody back there to guard the household and everybody else but he takes 318 of them and they start to pursue and so they pursued them unto dan abram's going to war it's not for gold it's not for silver it's not for territory He's going to war to defend his family and to deliver one of his family members from slavery. Well, that's interesting. You know, you bring up the idea of fighting battles and everything else, and, and the Christian community can be very demined, divided about that. Well, someone, oh, you know, I would, we just turn the other cheek, let him go. You know, I mean, Jesus did tell us in Matthew chapter 5 there, if someone strikes you one cheek, give to him the other cheek. But the idea is dealing with personal offense. Well, how can you say that? Simple. 
You get into John's gospel there, when you get to John uh, 18, verse 19, Jesus is in front of the high priest, and the high priest begins to ask him of his teaching and of his disciples and everything else, and Jesus says, I openly taught in the temple. I was there every day. Why don't you get those who heard me? Why don't you bring them in and ask them what I taught? Bam, somebody slapped him. Jesus turned to the one who slapped him and said, if I have spoken evil, then bear witness of the evil. But if I have spoken what is right or true, why do you hit me? Whoa, that was only one cheek. What Jesus was saying is, I'm not going to sit here and incriminate myself. You are the Sanhedrin. You are the high priest. There is a law that you are called to follow. I will not be my own witness against myself. You want to try me? Really persecute him. You want to try me? You go get your own witnesses. you got to have two of them who agree. That's what the law requires. So I'm not going to sit here and give you what you want. You go get witnesses. He defended himself. Which brings up a very important point. You have a right to defend your family. Someone comes in your house in the middle of the night. It's in the Old Testament, too. You, you know, there's certain requirements around it, but you have a right to defend your family. You go study it for yourself, because, again, there's a whole lot of position and opinion on this, but just look at Jesus. Yes, personal offense, turn the other cheek. For the love of Christ, forgive them. But when it comes to taking away your rights, you have a right to stand. And in this case with Abram, when it comes to taking away his family and enslaving him now to these other kings, he does something about it. He grabs his servants, he pursues after him, and he goes to battle. You know what happens next? We're out of time. We have to come back next week. Let's stand and pray. We can't talk about Melchizedek and who is he and what is he? Is he the Lord? Is he Shem? We don't have enough time for that. So, Father, we thank you for your word. And what I thank you for, Lord, is even when Abram makes some serious mistakes, you're still faithful. And you didn't leave him. You were faithful to complete the work you began in him. And as we'll see, chapter 15, that promise you made was dependent upon yourself. He didn't walk through that sacrifice with you. You walked alone. That Abrahamic covenant is based on your faithfulness. And Lord, I thank you that our salvation is based upon your son's faithfulness. It is finished. I pray for anyone here, Lord, they have made some bad decisions. They're not where they need to be with you right now in their walk. The enemy is telling them they can't come back. They're now a second-class citizen in the kingdom of God. How I pray for them, you would speak to them and call them back to that place of sitting at your feet again where they first fell in love with you and renew them and restore them and use them again. Thank you, Lord, for writing these things for our learning. And Lord, I do pray for anyone here that doesn't know you. All you ask is they would open their heart, receive you by faith, turn from their old life and embrace anew with you. Thank you for these things that they're so simple and yet they change us so profoundly. Go with the Flower Show team, fill them, overflow them. And may many people hear about your love for them today. In Jesus' name, amen.